never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord, not subcultural, not anti-cultural, but countercultural in the best ways possible. Well, hey, everybody. Um, this is uh, the third week in a series of messages where we're talking about what Paul wrote to the people that lived in ancient Rome. And he's describing to them basically like how to grow in your faith. Um, what does it look like for you to really kind of gain trust in who God is? And so this is um, kind of a really big deal because I, I want you to understand like Paul was a real person. Paul was writing to real people, um, and he was describing like a real faith in a real God. Now, that's kind of a big deal, um, but I want you to also understand when I describe Paul, um, maybe like some of you, Paul was somebody who didn't always believe that Jesus was who Jesus said he was. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Paul early on would have actually killed people who said that Jesus was who he said he was. But then Paul has an encounter with Jesus after he's come back from the dead, and it changes everything for Paul. So he's going to go around to, to like different parts of the Mediterranean. He's going to start new churches. He's going to write letters to them, and he's going to kind of give them some instruction on life and faith. And so it's what we call the book of Romans in kind of the New Testament part of the Bible. And it's what we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. And so we're going to spend some more time looking at that tonight. Now, um, over the last few weeks, we've also been working on kind of memorizing this pivotal verse that's in what we call Romans chapter 12. And so I want us to begin with that. Um, and hopefully we're going to have a little bit of fun as we work together on like actually memorizing what this says. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the um, verse up on the screen that we've done the last couple of weeks. And if you're new here with us for the first time, it's okay. We're going to help you catch up. All right. But this is what um, Romans 12, 11, this is what this says. And we're in this, this series of messages called Ferber. The reason why we're in a series of messages called Ferber is because you're going to see it in this verse um, in Romans 12, 11. All right. So let me read it once. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now, what I want us to do is um, I want us to read this out loud together, and then from there, we're going to start playing a little game. Yeah? All right. So let's read this out loud together. We're going to start with the word never. So never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now, here's what they're going to do up top, because um, they're in on my game. They're going to start taking words away, and we're going to keep reading it, and it's going to kind of help us kind of lock this in this week. All right, so we're working on memorizing this over the next few weeks. Tonight could be a really big step for you, all right? So I'm going to have them take a couple of words away, and then we're just going to read it together again. All right, you guys ready? Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now, they're not done, and neither am I. They're going to take away more words, and we're just going to read it again. All right, you guys are pros at this at this point, all right? So let's start again. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. As you might imagine, because they're in on this game, they're going to take away even more words. I mean, this is what we think is fun around here, all right? So I'm going to have them take away more words. We're going to say it together again. I said I was going to have them take away more words. What were you expecting? All right. So the first word is what? Yeah, there you go. So now you're ready to go. All right. So never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. But keep and keeping are almost the same. All right. Sorry I messed you up there. All right. So this is what Paul writes in um, Romans chapter 12, verse 11. 
Now, I want to recap kind of what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, because I think in that recap, it's going to help set up the big theme for what we're talking about today. All right. So Paul begins this part of his letter by writing this. All right. He says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, we're going to call that Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And just so you know, again, Paul's writing a letter. Paul didn't write in chapters and verses. We put those in, you know, since then so that I could tell you where to go and you could tell me where to go and I mean, not tell me where to go. That's weird. Um, but like it helps us kind of find our places in the scriptures, right? But we would call it Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And he's simply saying, man, in view of God's mercy, man, you'd offer your bodies as a living sacrifice because of what Jesus has done man, you're going to offer your body as a living sacrifice. And then Paul's going to go in right after that and say, man, because of that, don't conform any, any more to the world. Like, let God transform your mind. And so we talked about that two weeks ago. Last week, we talked about the heart where, you know, Paul's going to spend a paragraph talking about serving one another. And if you didn't catch either one of those messages, man, in our app, on our website, um, on our YouTube channel, like you can totally get caught up with those. But again, Paul's describing this like, oh, living sacrifices. Like if you want to be a living sacrifice, this is what you do. You'd serve people. And then he's going to walk into and kind of reinforce that faith is not just a vertical thing. That faith is actually a horizontal thing. And Paul learned that from Jesus. See, living sacrifices aren't just people who exhibit self-control or self-deprivation, or really good willpower. It's not about church attendance. It's not even about rules keeping. Living sacrifices understand that they got good treatment from someone over them that they didn't deserve. And because of that, it moves them to pass that on to others. It came to them for free, for, for free, and so living sacrifices then pass it on for free. Living sacrifices remember this mercy. And so because of that, they don't conform to the world and they serve others. And what Paul is writing, again, to real people who lived in a real place in ancient Rome, what he's writing confronts this narcissistic version of faith that many of us have. And, and it's simply this, that faith is really just between, you know, me and God. But not for followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus recognize that because we've been loved, we love others. That faith looks horizontally, not just vertically. Living sacrifices look around themselves and practice love, not just looking up to God. If you want to be a living sacrifice, in view of God's mercy, then you're going to serve others. And then it's going to lead to the thing he talks about to us. Because the love of God is demonstrated. It's authenticated by our love for other people. This is not rule keeping. I mean, horizontal authenticates the vertical. How I'm treating you authenticates how I'm following God. The way I'm living my life authenticates whether I'm truly following Jesus, that I'm truly loving God with all of my heart and with all of my soul and with all of my strength. And so that brings us back to a few fairly basic lines that we're going to be focusing on today. But by basic, I don't mean unimportant, not at all. By basic, I mean foundational to our horizontally and not just vertically focused faith. And so this is what we get to that Paul's writing that we're going to focus on today. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love and honor one another above yourselves. And then right after that, it's the verse that we memorized earlier which you still have memorized, right? Begins with the word never. Say it with me. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. 
So in this part of the letter that Paul has written, this is what he's saying, living sacrifices. Man, in view of God's mercy, you serve other people and you love other people. It's not just about a vertical relationship with God. This affects our horizontal as well. Fundamentally, Paul is telling us that relationships, they're everything. That they're everything to a relational God who created us. He created you and he created me to be relational. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, then you still recognize the truth that when your relationships are good, life is good. And I think that you're gonna find that some of the things that Paul says here will just be helpful in life if you put them into practice. But if you are a follower of Jesus, then while, again, you and I may still recognize that, you know, when relationships are good, life is good, we have a deeper motivation for this sincere love that Paul's talking about. We don't just do it because it works. We do it because we've been loved and we've been called to love others. Again, God doesn't just want this to be vertically focused on loving him or vertically focused on obeying him or vertically focused on asking forgiveness from him or vertically focused on you know, not doing things that hurt him. Instead, God wants us to be horizontally focused on loving others around us on humbling ourselves and submitting to other people around us, on asking forgiveness of other people around us, on not doing things, not making choices that hurt other people around us. So I want you to think um, with me for just a moment, you're gonna anticipate this, I'm sure, about cell phones, all right? So I want you to think about cell phones. Um, phones come with an agreement, right, between you and the phone company, the phone provider. Now, some of you, you're gonna be able to track with me. Um, some of you are gonna have a hard time um, remembering what I'm about to describe because you weren't even born yet, all right? Um, but we're gonna get through this together, all right? Um, do any of you remember with cell phones what was called free nights and weekends? <laughs> Anybody? Let me just give you a little bit of context if you're like, what? Um, so uh, there was a day back in the 1900s, when, um, when the cell phone companies would tell you that you had something like 100 free minutes, and that was it, all right? And um, you could use those anytime you wanted, but the sweet spot came like after 9 p.m. and the weekends, because then you could make phone calls for free. This whole era of time, I like to call college, all right? Now, perhaps longer than we should have, I'll admit, that, you know, because, you know, cell phones and, and plans change, but longer than we should have, much longer than we should have, uh, we actually kept my wife on a cell phone plan where she was limited in the number of texts she could send. She could send like 50 a month. Can you imagine 50 a month? And then you started having to pay for them after that. Yeah. So some of you are thinking, Oh my goodness, wow, this guy's old, all right? Um, some of you are thinking, I remember those days, that's great. Some of you are like, man, they had some really convoluted you know, phone systems way back in the day. Some of you remember getting a landline in your house for the first time, and yet here we are together, one big happy family. All right, we're gonna get through it. So now I want you to think about your current phone agreement, all right? Even if you don't pay for it, all right? Think about your current phone agreement. Would you trade your current phone agreement for either of the agreements that I just described. You know, 50 texts a month, or you can only use your phone after nine and on the weekends. Yeah? Would anybody trade them for that? Why not? Well, the reason why not is because you have an agreement with a phone company now that is much better. Like, why would you want to go back to something that is obsolete when you now have something that is superior? Yeah? Now, that seems pretty basic, right? I mean, it's easy to see with a phone agreement. But I also want you to see the same thing applies within this relationship that God wants with us and the relationship that God wants 
us to have with each other. All right, so follow me here. Um, when, when, I'm sorry, what we call in the Old Testament in the Bible, um, it's organized around um, an agreement, around a covenant that God had with the ancient people of Israel. All right, it was stories that kind of emerged from that agreement. But you and me were not ancient Israel. And with the coming of Jesus, the former agreement, the former covenant is completed. And now we have a new covenant through Jesus. It's a new and it's a better covenant. It's a superior one because the old one is obsolete. So we don't take our application cues any longer from the old covenant, the old agreement. Instead, we take our application cues from Jesus's new covenant commands. So when it comes to knowing how to live your life, knowing what to do with your finances, knowing how to treat the people around you, the people at your work, the people at your school, the people that are on the soccer team, we take those cues now from what Jesus did. And this is what he did at the end of his ministry. He's gathering his closest followers together. They're having a meal. And at that meal, Jesus gives them a new command. And the new command wasn't like the other commands. This new command was was a North Star command. This new command was a preeminent command. This is what Jesus says, all right? A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. In other words, don't love the way you've been loved by others. In fact, don't even love others the way that you want them to love you. I know we call that the golden rule, but this is something that goes beyond the golden rule. I want you to treat people that you meet the people in your family, the people down the street, the people in your school, the people at work. I want you to treat everyone with dignity. I want you to treat everyone the way that your heavenly father treated you. Love them like I've loved you. And then the next day, Jesus would put on a demonstration of that love that took their breath away because it took his breath away. See, according to Jesus, this new covenant, this new promise that he's made with us, it's based on love and it's not just a part of it. It is central to it. So Paul and Jesus, they're both reminding us that healthy, godly, enjoyable relationships, they're not accidental. There's a structure to them that makes them thrive. And that is that we get ourselves out of the way and we put other people first. Sincere love, what Paul is writing to to us, sincere love isn't based on performance. It's not rooted in comparison. It's not paralyzed by overthinking. We just act sincerely. But Paul's going to go a little bit further. He's going to give us three next steps in what he's written here that I think are going to help us know that we can love sincerely. This is the first one, all right? Hate and cling. Paul says, man, hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Like celebrate, accentuate, cling to the good in somebody else. And this is not a tolerance of evil things that will hurt them. I mean, I think part of some of the countercultural things that Paul talks about a little bit earlier, he says, man, don't don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Part of the countercultural part of this is not just going along with whatever somebody says. And that potentially we would disagree with them and we'd love them outrageously all at the same time. So can we talk about sin just for a minute, all right? Uh, about what it really actually means, because sin is definitely a church word. Like, nobody else uses it, all right? If you, excuse me, if you were to get um, pulled over for speeding going home tonight, and you were, you know, going to actually admit to the police officer that you were speeding, um, when he got to the window, you would not say, oh, no, I've sinned. (laughs) 
you'd say, oh no, I broke the law, right? Like when we break a rule, when we break a law, we don't label it sin, all right? I mean, this is what's interesting. I mean, if you broke the law, you might call a lawyer, but if you commit a sin, you're not calling a sinner, right? Like that's not how this works. I mean, this is, it's a weird word. It's a church word. So what makes a sin a sin? Well, let's see if we can get some clarity on that. Um, but I want you to, to begin with thinking about the way that you think about, you know, God's rules. Uh, understand that God didn't create people so that there would be someone to keep his pre-existing rules. God issued laws, he issued commands because he wanted to benefit the people that he loved. I mean, similarly, all right, parents don't have children so that their children can play with the toys. The toys are for the children. You didn't buy a car so that you'd have a place to store the gasoline. You put gas in your car because you want your car to go somewhere. So God has rules. God has expectations. There are commands that he's given to us. I'm not arguing with that at all. But they're not for the sake of having rules and expectations and commands that he can, can zap us for when we don't follow them. They exist because he loves us and he created us and he knows what is best for us. But we usually approach God's commands from a different angle, a different perspective, all right? Uh, sometimes we ask, I've asked, maybe you've asked, you know, does the Bible say that you know, blank is a sin? I mean, that's a question that you ask when you're more concerned with a view than a you. When you're more concerned uh, about the rule rather than the person that the rule would affect, I mean, look, let's be honest. Um, when we ask this question, we're usually asking this question because we either want to do blank or we want to talk someone else into doing blank, right? And the assumption that we always make when we're in this conversation is that, you know, if, if the Bible doesn't condemn it, then God must condone it. But not according to Jesus. Because when Jesus came, he came to reveal the heart, the soul, the intent of his heavenly father. According to Jesus, what's good for people is what's good and what's not is not. Jesus had no patience. He had no tolerance for good people who weren't good to people. So there's two kind of key principles when we think about sin in our life. Uh, when we're thinking about, man, what would I hate? And then what would I cling to? All right. So here's the first one. Uh, not good for you then you shouldn't do, all right? And this is what I'm, I mean by that. Like, if it's bad for you, it's a sin. And, and in some ways, you're sinning even against yourself. God is concerned about how you treat yourself because he loves you. Here's the other one. Not good for them, it should be condemned. Rhyming is just what we do in my profession, all right? Um, but like, this, this is what we have to wrestle with when somebody else or there's a group of people that are being mistreated, we should say something. God values people most. So do you know why Jesus characterized and defined sin this way? It's because it's the way his heavenly father viewed sin. He's for you and he's for the yous that are around you. So, I, I mean, I don't know, there's a ton of stories in this room, but for you, are you harming you or others around you? And Jesus wants you to stop it. Is there a habit or is there a relationship that would harm someone if it became known? Is it a behavior that's chipping away at, at your own self-respect? Is it something that you thought you had under control and now it's out of control? I mean, would you be willing? Are you able to acknowledge it and accept that Jesus' invitation is to follow him because this is baked into the invitation that you'd be willing to leave 
your sin and walk away from it. To hate what is evil and cling to what is good, not because God is going to get you, but because sin will break you. And it's already breaking you. And it's breaking the hearts of people around you who love you. Now, I've been talking you know, directly to some of you, but for others of you, there's a conversation that you should have with someone because you know it would be the most loving thing. And I know you don't want to because it would be awkward, but what would be the most loving thing? Do you see evil that you should be hating because you know it's hurting them? Is there someone you should be loving enough to talk to them? That the way you would cling to their good is by actually having the conversation. You'd love them enough to embrace the awkward. You'd love them enough to be awkward because I cannot promise you that it wouldn't be awkward, but I can promise you that it would be worth it because you're following your heavenly father. That we would hate what is evil, but we would cling to what is good. And that would lead us to this second next step that Paul is giving us to ensure sincere love. And it's simply that we would be devoted. Relationships are marked by committing ourselves to the other and to their good. But that means it's gonna cost us. Because you should be devoted to people who frankly and likely don't deserve being devoted to. Now, that's a tension, right? Because I am certain you could easily give me 10 examples of people that you're called to be devoted to and that you're called to love. And if you're a follower of Jesus, it's what you know that you should do. But honestly, they don't deserve it. It would make more sense to write them off. But that isn't truly what helps you, and it's not the thing that would help them thrive. And that's why some of the approaches that we take, where we're really casual and and we're ready to cancel, they leave us empty. And we've lost this ability, this art, to stick by people when they fall short. And Paul understands this tension. He writes other letters, you know, to the ancient city of Ephesus. um, He actually writes something That's really important for us to grasp. He says, you know, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Well, why would I want to submit to somebody who who doesn't even deserve to be submitted to? Why would I be devoted to somebody who doesn't deserve to be devoted to? Frankly, that's kind of the point. I mean, for you and for me, we're presuming that, you know, we're worth being devoted to, that we're worth being submitted to as well. I mean, the the real tension here is that um, you're not submitting out of reverence to them. You're not even submitting out of reverence to yourself. You're submitting out of reverence to Christ because Jesus in the garden submitted to his father and went to the cross and died for us, which means for you and for me, we don't have to have our way anymore. We don't have to always get in the last word. And it's not because they're worth it. It's because Jesus is worth it. Paul wrote something else. Um, This is to the ancient city of Colossae. It's what we call the book of Colossians. But um, to those um, early followers, he said, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance at all, like anything going on with somebody else, forgive them. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I mean, can I be honest? It's actually one of the scarier verses in the entire scriptures for me that I would forgive as God has forgiven me. I mean, why would I do that? Because she's not worth forgiving. I mean, forgive him. Do you know what he did to me or do you know what he refused to do for me? I'm afraid if I forgive them, they're not gonna know that they can't get by with it and they might try it again. But actually what Jesus is trying to lead us to, what Paul, when he's writing to the people in Rome, when he's writing to us, out of this new covenant command that Jesus gives is to say, man, if we have a problem with somebody, the new covenant command leads us to forgive them, not because they're worth it. And not because, honestly, it would potentially even, you know, kind of give a release to you. I mean, that's true. 
No, you forgive because you have been forgiven much greater by someone greater who has greater power to give to you to do the forgiving that right now you're resisting doing. The tension is real. Let me go then to this final um, next step that Paul gives, which is to honor others. To honor others above ourselves. I mean, this is humility. Not that we'd center ourselves in situations, but we would center other people, their feelings, their emotions. We'd honor them. And for that, um, let me tell you a story about my last week. Um, so um, we, have, we have four kids. I have three daughters. And um, they are all um, involved in high school drama. And by that, I mean theater, although they are also involved in high school drama, all right? Um, one of my daughters, um, you know, the whole, like, music thing in particular, like, she was kind of first on the scene among them for that. I mean, she's taking private lessons. Um, she's actually, you know, done some stuff at state and got some awards at state. Um, and I'm not saying that necessarily to brag. Um, I'm saying that because it's kind of going to be important to the story, all right? She's kind of gone first in this and so High School Musical comes along, and um, they're auditioning, uh, two of them for sure, and then they talk the underclassmen into auditioning as well. So it's a big deal, you know, do the auditions. Everybody goes to sleep Saturday night because it's still not posted. Uh, there's a thing called callback. I mean, if you do really well, you get a callback, and the whole notion of that is, you know, you could actually get the part that you were going for. I go to sleep. I don't know, it's not posted yet. It's not that big of a deal. Until I wake up the next morning and my wife rolls over and says, they um, posted the, uh, the callback list. Two of my three daughters have made the list, but not the third one. The third one for whom music was actually the one she kind of set the course for. And I do what, um, what responsible parents do. I think my wife should handle this. Um, <laughs> I mean, she's been up for about two hours in the middle of the night because it got posted at like, I don't know, 11.30. Um, so we're laying in bed, just kind of wondering what we're going to do. And... Um, and I realize leading her handle it isn't going to be the right thing. So I get up and uh, um, I go around the corner into, um, into a bedroom and two of the daughters are standing there. The underclassman who's gotten a call back and my daughter who didn't. What do you do? I mean, you want to be able to go up to your daughter who got a call back and say, that's awesome. But do you do that 12 inches from the one who didn't? Like, how do you handle that? And so I'm, you know, panicking inside myself because, um, you know, I'm a grown, responsible man and I can handle this. I'm like, what do I say? So I, I come up with a really great sentence. I say, so you guys see the list? <laughs> Maybe they didn't see it. Maybe it got deleted. Maybe the internet's gone. I don't know. And, um, and my daughter, who didn't get a call back, with an amount of energy and excitement that she could not generate on her own, looked at me and said, isn't it awesome that she got a call back? I mean, that's amazing. I mean, for an underclassman to be able to get something like that, that is completely incredible. And I'm misty-eyed at this point going, what in the world just happened? Um, because my daughter is reflecting what Paul is writing and honoring others above yourself. Man, it's how you show sincere love. And I know this to be true. There's nothing within her innately that lets her do that. She's not digging into her own power to do that. She's digging into a power a new covenant, love people fiercely power. A, man, keep your spiritual fervor power. I mean, she can honor people 
even in the midst of her own heartbreak. Man, what would it look like for followers of Jesus to honor people, put people above ourselves? The only way you can do that is when you recognize, I've been loved like that. I've, I've been regarded by someone greater than me who thinks that I'm worth the sacrifice of his son. And it all hinges on love. We, um, we had somebody that um, had, had kind of said something about Suncrest um, and kind of came across my, my desk. It was a critique, honestly. It was a critique from somebody that said, uh, the problem with you guys, the problem with Suncrest is they have a bunch of hypersensitive Christians who think it's all about love. And I got to tell you, the way they intended it is not the way it landed. Not in me. Because um, if that's a problem, then I am a child of that problem. I mean, I'll be a problem child. My mom would probably tell you I've already been a problem child. But if that's a problem, I'm a child of that problem. And fervor, and fervor calls it you to be a child of that problem too. Let me pray for us. Well, I really hope that was helpful for integrating faith with life. Listen, if you're in Northwest Indiana, I'd love to have you join us in person. Head over to suncrest.org and plan your visit.